Welcome everyone uh, to Ramadan Quran Feast and Ramadan Mubarak. Um, I'm just going to say a couple words about um, receiving noon and a couple announcements very quickly, and then we'll turn to today's uh, presenter, Fatma Noor. Um, so I wanted to first um, actually share receiving our website in case not everybody has seen. This is, as many of you know, Receiving Noor is a, a non-profit uh, dedicated to Quranic wisdom. The met motto is grounded faith, peaceful surrender, inspired living. Grounded faith because too often uh, people feel, think that faith is blind, whereas the Quran invites us to a faith that is grounded in evidences and signs, ayat, outside of us and inside us. And peaceful surrender, because it's a choice, the more we get to be assured of um, the existence of our creator, our rub, our sustainer, the more we are able to surrender peacefully. And that's an existential choice that we can um, make. And then the more we make that, inshallah, we're inspired living. We live in, uh, in an inspired way, uh, in a way that uh, is in tune with our fitra and our connection to our rub. Um, in um, the Resumenu website, um, th there is also the uh, Ramadan um, resources. There are a number of readings on Ramadan. And also the, there's this um, Ramadan daily spiritual um, exercise that was developed in the last couple of years at Receiving Noor. And um, so I wanted to uh, attract your attention to it. You can click here. Uh, uh, it's um, a short form that will take maybe two or three minutes to fill, fill out. Um, uh, and the notion is to um, do this daily uh, to nurture uh, intentional surrender and gratitude and stay afar. So when you click here, you will see that um, we encourage some meditation in the morning and in the evening. Um, there are five med meditations um, either with the voice of Sister Sarah Al Alam or with uh, Brother Kenny. Uh, and then um, it's completely anonymous, so nobody is going to be checking your progress or anything. It's just for yourself. Um, and, um, you know, how, how soon do you pray? How much do you each day um, not only recite the Quran, but also reflect the Quran, reflect on the Quran? And that's something uh, needed, needed much more in. Um, our lives, uh, there's a lot of emphasis on reciting it, which is which is fine, but uh, it can't be at the expense of, of uh, sitting with the Quran and reflecting with the Quran. And then uh, there there is this um, pledge of Obadiyah that was written by the Sunni team, team, um, uh, and uh, to um, take a moment to recognize. Uh, and uh, consciously commit to the meaning of um, Ramadan through our fasting, we recognize our neediness and um, uh, gratitude and so on. So this can be accessed from the website. And um, and so we then come back to our uh, Ramadan uh, Quran feast. Uh, it is a an encouragement to have us um, reflect on the Quran a bit more and receiving new friends are presenting and Dr. Yamina uh, is also present to um, offer her insights and, and comments. And um, it's a short, very short session. We have around one hour and um, each Saturday we will have someone present um, or sometimes more than one person presenting. And then we um, we will, um, we we will have a, a discussion Q&A. &A. And the idea here is to read the Quran um, in a way that um, makes us connect with our creator. Uh, our first presenter for today is Fatma Noor Koksal. Uh, some of you may recall her from the book club that she ran um, last time uh, uh, in the fall with Zahra Musala. She also presented in last um, Ramadan um, feast. Uh, I, I guess she was the first pre first week presenter last time as well. Um, so I want to give you a quick bio of Fatma Noor and then I'll, I'll turn it over to her. Uh, Sister Fatma Noor studied English uh, language and literature in Turkey. And in the US, she studied uh, instructional systems technology. 
Uh, she worked as an instructional designer and a teacher for a few years. And she currently lives in Poland with her family. I think she, you have three kids, right? Is that scale? Yeah. yeah. Her most recent dream is writing picture books. She has done insightful work on teaching kids faith concepts. And she actually has an amazing, mashallah, blog uh, on how to nurture um, grounded faith uh, with uh, children. Um, uh, this file was shared in the newsletter. So you will have access to those links if you um, look at this week's newsletter. Uh, and she also uh, penned essays on living faith mindfully and with the names of God. Much of that is in Turkish, but hopefully uh, we'll have more translations coming. So without further delay, I'll turn um, to Fatma Nur. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, let me share my screen first. Uh, it says, host, host disabled screen sharing, Isra. Oh, can you make my other name also co-host, Isra? Because I uh, am access with two names. Uh, okay, Bismillah. <clears throat> uh, thank you for your invitation again, Isra. It uh, it becomes kind of hard, but uh, otherwise, I I don't know. I feel like that uh, we don't make the space to reflect and concentrate uh, as we are supposed to do. I I think these are very precious opportunities. Uh, to reflect and be together, inshallah. Uh, today, what I am going to share uh, will be mostly uh, a summary uh, of the introduction of uh, this book. Probably most of you know, this is a, a book uh, put together by uh, Dr. Yamina and uh, Isra, and it contains selections uh, from Said Nursi's Epistles of Life. And when I was reading this book, <clears throat> especially in the introduction part, I several times re read the introduction part because uh, they, uh, they give a very comprehensive uh, analysis of how Imam Nursi uh, uh, approached the Quran. Actually, I have been reading his works for several years, but this was the first time uh, I encountered uh, such a comprehensive, such a clean uh, analysis. And uh, it inspired me a lot because I felt like that, okay, uh, this, this time they don't give me a fish, but they teach me uh, how to fish because I, I was then, when I saw his approach, uh, put together um, next to each other, like uh, what is he emphasizing and what is he de-emphasizing, uh, I was able to see a more complete picture uh, so that I can also adapt uh, because I, I really like his <clears throat> commentary uh, on the Quranic verses, but uh, I just read and uh, uh, I'm not able to take his methods and apply uh, uh, to the Quran myself, but when I read their uh, introduction, uh, it inspired me and I wanted to read the Quran. And uh, I don't know, I, it gave me courage kind of. So I thought maybe this inspiration will also be useful for you. Uh, so I just tried to uh, uh, in this presentation, I will just try to give a summary uh, uh, of the introduction part of this book, inshallah. Uh, and just a quick reminder first, uh, of probably in receiving new classes, some of you already studied this topic, uh, but I just wanted to uh, 
uh, give a brief summary. Uh, why do I go to the Quran in the first place? Uh, I especially like this quotation, which was uh, in Quran as the revelation blog. And uh, I will read from here. I find existence opaque and confusing without any explanation from its maker. I expect him to speak and explain what he is doing and what I should make of it. Uh, I really like this because uh, if I am satisfied uh, with whatever I find on earth, uh, I, I wouldn't need any revelation or, or I wouldn't need any speech uh, from the maker of this uh, universe. Uh, but uh, if I'm if I have problems and if if I can't find answers uh, from what is around me, uh, I desperately need the guidance of uh, my maker, uh, of course, uh, first I need to testify to the fact that uh, there should be a maker, but I will just skip these parts and uh, give the, just this quick reminder. <clears throat> okay, I, uh, I will start directly by a verse, uh, <clears throat> which is uh, verse 111 from Surah Tawbah. Uh, today I'll just read the translation of the verses. Uh, God has purchased the lives and possessions of the believers in return for paradise. Uh, I, um, I would like to ask something. If any of you, well, I have a condition. <laughs> if any of you, uh, if there is any of you who is not familiar to receiving Noor classes or Risale Noor. Uh, if there is someone like this uh, uh, with us, uh, have you ever read anything about this verse in a tafsir or in a commentary, in a book? Uh, if you remember, can you share, this, share it with us? <laughs> if and there is anyone like that. Or could it be, uh, even if they haven't read anything, but their initial impression of this when they read it here? Yeah, of course, yeah. I mean, uh, but if they are kind of uh, familiar with receiving their classes, they might uh, sp give spoilers. <laughs> okay, uh, if not, uh, I'll just uh, continue. I can tell you, I can tell you uh -huh. what uh, the way it was explained to me earlier. It okay. is like you pay like for your sadaqa, your zakah, and when you pay that, then and then you will get into Jannah. Like so you like it's like like the better you do in in um in contributing, in paying, that will be uh, that will be traded in by Jenna, basically. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Alia. Um... I can also say that I used to, before I got familiar with Risali Noor and receiving Noor, I used to think that it's about martyrdom because it's saying also lives, uh, positions and lives. So, you know, you, you need to um, die in a just war for God's sake. Then you have, you know, sold your life to God. That was um, my understanding. And, part of, you know, and I was like, okay, so it's not an opportunity, quite, quite an opportunity for me. Um, but for those who were martyrs for God, then they, they purchased, you know, paradise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for sharing because... I haven't read any commentary anywhere else. Uh, so that was real helpful. But uh, from the book, uh, I learned that uh, uh, in the Esbab al Nuzul literature, which is uh, the literature which is taking the initial historical context uh, of the verses uh, into account, and they generally analyze or interpret the verses according to the initial historical context. 
uh, and in that literature they were placing the verse in the context of the oath of uh, Akabe in late Meccan period. Uh, the oath was taken by a small group of men and women from Medina uh, who accepted Prophet Muhammad's message and invited him to migrate to Medina to escape religious persecution. Uh, they promised to worship only one God and to defend the prophet from physical attacks as they would defend their own selves and families. Uh, so this verse was kind of, according to that interpretation, this verse was addressing to them, like their possessions and lives are purchased by God, uh, <clears throat> kind of in return to the prophet's uh, life and uh, mission. Uh, but whenever uh, I read such an interpretation, it puts some distance between me and uh, the message, uh, because I don't feel myself as a direct addressee. Uh, so uh, I read it and I think oh, that's good and I admire them, I adore them, but it doesn't uh, make a transformation in my life. Uh, when we look at the uh, Risale Nur, we see the same verse uh, is placed in a cosmic uh, context. Uh, Imam Nursi uh, tells us that here is a bargain uh, which is available to everyone, not just uh, for those people uh, in Medina. Here's a transaction uh, extended to every uh, one of us. Uh, so. Uh, God has purchased the lives and possessions of the believers in return for paradise. Uh, uh, he goes in detail and uh, he tells that uh, we are called to uh, sell kind of our lives and possessions, but sell meaning that uh, use, uh, transform the use of your life and your possessions. Use them not in, your, in the name of your ego, but in the name of God. And when, when this is interpreted like this, uh, uh, it becomes possible to confirm uh, or reject this claim because I can look at my experience and I can see whether I am uh, starting to live a paradise-like life or no, it doesn't work. Uh, I can see people who are using their possessions and life uh, in the name of their ego and see whether they are happy or not. Uh, so it becomes possible for me to see the truthfulness of the verse. Uh, and it's uh, it becomes relatable to me. Uh, so I wanted to start with this verse because, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, because uh, when I read in the book this historical context, I was so surprised because I have never read about it. And um, and if it wasn't Risale Nur, I would never be able to uh, come up with uh, such an interpretation. Maybe even I heard someone making such a comment, I would think that, oh, okay, no, you are going too far, I would say. Uh, but because Imam Nursi is so consistent uh, in his method, uh, and because I have a respect to him, uh, God, thanks to his works, uh, I take this interpretation seriously. But now I ask, uh, how, how come? How come he is able to come up with uh, such an interpretation? What kind of a mindset makes him? Uh, gives him this courage to make such an interpretation. And now I would like to dive deep with you together in his uh, mindset for a few minutes. Uh, first, uh, uh, he, uh, Imam Nursi reminds us uh, the fact, the four factors to keep in mind for a faithful reading uh, of the text. Actually, this is, I think, uh, uh, for any text, I need to keep these four factors to keep in 
I need to keep in mind these four factors, not just for the Quran, uh, but when it is the Quran or any revelation, it becomes even uh, more vital, uh, I guess. Uh, so first uh, point is the speaker, who the speaker is. Like when I am reading the, when I am listening to the Quran, when I am reading the revelation, who is speaking? Like uh, be sometimes uh, <clears throat> uh, fall into the mistake that, oh, words are important, but no, a word uh, uttered by my uh, child or the, a word uttered by my friend or both might mean totally different things. The same words, but it will be totally different meaning. So uh, Nursi defines Quran as a universal address from the creator of the heavens and the earth. So uh, whenever uh, I read it, I, I, I need to be, uh, I need to make sure that, okay, here is someone speaking who is the owner, who is the creator of all the heavens and the earth. And of course, at this point, how I recognize him, like, is he all powerful? Is he all merciful? Uh, is he all seeing? Uh, matters a lot. How I see him, how I recognize him. Uh, and the second uh, audience, muhatab, uh, I also put uh, uh, Arabic uh, words for this next to them. Uh, the, he tell, uh, we understand that the Quran speaks to all periods of history and to all classes of people, not only to the people of uh, Asr Zadet, meaning like the uh, prophet and his companions. No, the, uh, the claim of the Quran is to be a guidance to all periods of history and to all classes of people. So when I am reading it in 2023 in Poland, it Quran is talking to me here and now. And the purpose, uh, Maksad, he sees the major purpose of the revelation is as to guide us in answering four human questions about the meaning of existence and to solve the riddle of the universe. Of course, this guidance is done through these concepts, probably you have heard about them, Tevhid, Risale, Hashr, Adal, and Ubudiye, but the major purpose is uh, to guide us in our uh, core human questions. And, and so <clears throat> uh, when, <clears throat> Quranic purposes never about giving technical information about history, social norms, or nature, or about providing literary entertainment. Rather, whatever the Quran mentions, uh, from a prophetic narrative to a description of end of times, to a bee making honey, to financial contracts, whatever the Quran mentions, the aim is to make the transcendent known and also to answer our questions to guide us. So this is why the Quran emphasizes that it is not poetry or fables of the ancients. And the last context, the maqam, and the context is not, is not the uh, uh, initial historical context, no. It is the cosmic show unfolding each moment around me and within me. Uh, so, Actually, the Arabic ones are easier to remember because in when we in halakas in Turkish we would call them four M's: mutakallim, muhatab, maksat, and makam. So if we establish these four, uh, I don't know, cornerstones, uh, well, uh, it will take us a um, more oriented and. Uh, an understanding which is on Sirat al-Mustaqim and which is more uh, universal, which is to the uh, point. I think uh, as I was asking how come uh, he was able to come up with a, such uh, courageous interpretation, I think one of the most important things uh, is these four, uh, four factors and how he is uh, taking these four uh, 
factors into account while reading any verse. And so, uh, is he was a, able to define the Quran in a totally original way, uh, thanks to his understanding. So it is not he's not looking at the Quran as if it, it is something needs to be explained. Explained? No, it is an explanation. It's explanation rather than something that is to be explained. Explained. An eternal commentary on the great book of the universe. Uh, it's a treasure map disclosing treasures of meaning embedded in the world around us and within us. And the fact that uh, the Quran and the cosmos should complement each other all the time. And the signs of the verbal Quran uh, enlighten the signs of the macro Quran. And in turn, the signs of the macro Quran lets me confirm the truth of the message of the Quran. So. I need to be. I need to be reading. I need to be co-reading, uh, or co-listening uh, to the verbal speech and to the speech through uh, creation. And lastly, uh, he sees the Quran indispensable for understanding the reality. Like without, uh, it gives. It should give me such an understanding that I can't. I can't receive it anywhere. Uh, around around me from people or from things themselves uh, i know this is kind of condensed but i will give uh, examples and i hope they will be more clear for you and uh, he approached the quran not as an authority to be blindly fo followed but as a guide he he doesn't uh, he's not afraid of asking questions like are of course these not these are not the exact questions, but just they are paraphrased. Uh, are the signs of God that the Quran talks about really there? How do we perceive and verify them? How does giving God satisfy my heart and enlighten my life? What are the implications of believing God? So he consistently, all the time, tries to uh, confirm the verbal speech uh, by looking at the speech, uh, speech to re through creation, uh, this is uh, uh, we see the same approach sometimes uh, in other commentaries. But um, I think what makes um, uh, the method of Imam Nursi exceptional is the fact that he is so consistent. Like if he uh, wants to understand the belief in angels, he uses the same method. He looks at the creation again. If he wants to understand the belief in resurrection, he again he looks at the creation all the time. Uh, he's uh, there is no exception, kind of. Uh, so, especially in our age, I find this approach uh, so outstanding because I I feel like that. Being Muslim or like now, you know, uh, tolerance is a very big topic and um, okay, this is Muslim and they have their sacred book and they are doing this and that is totally okay. And it, I feel like that uh, it is uh, regarded such a, a, a like a et ethnic practice. It's regarded like as a culture and that is okay, no problem. We accept you, kind of, but uh, both myself and both for um, my environment, I think this approach is so outstanding. I should be, uh, yeah, if I, if I want to be safe and secure, uh, I should be all the time, uh, be able to confirm this verbal speech, verbal guidance through my experiences in myself and around myself. Okay, I talked a lot. Um, <clears throat> now uh, we will look at some examples of how uh, he is reading, uh, he is co-reading uh, the universe and the Quran, inshallah. <clears throat> uh, is there any question until this point? before the examples. Probably there is a lot, maybe after examples, it will be more clear. Uh, 
Yeah, I think we should keep going after your presentation. Uh, we will have to. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, the first example. Uh, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Okay. He reads uh, this verse in the Quran. You know, it is uttered several times. Uh, and uh, but he doesn't regard this as a declaration. No, he takes it as a guidance. He reads this and he'll start to look at the page of the dynamic page of the creation. Like, is it really so? Do I witness uh, in the name of God on the page of the creation? He wants to see it. Like it is because, as I said, he looks at the Quran as a treasure map. If the treasure map emphasizes that everything starts with Bismillah and is it really so? Is it true? How can I see it? How can I witness it? Uh, and uh, he builds his thinking on, on this idea and he starts to see that beings are accomplishing tasks beyond their capacity. And uh, Bismillah, and at last he concludes that uh, Bismillah is not simply an invocation that a believer is called to utter. No, it is expressed by the entire universe. Uh, so it becomes so natural for also human beings to say Bismillah because, but the, the thing is, it is left to my choice uh, only. Uh, so it is not just, uh, I'm, okay, yes, I am Muslim and we say Bismillah. It's kind of an ethnic practice. No, I see, I look, and I see that, yes, this is a universal reality, and I want to join it. Uh, <clears throat> okay, next example. Again, uh, the you probably you know there are a lot of verses in the Quran related to gratitude related to thanks. Will they not then give thanks? And we shall surely reward those who give thanks. Worship God and be of those who give thanks. Again, uh, he reads all of these verses, but he's not like only oh yes we should be thankful to God. No, he doesn't leave it here. Uh, as again, he takes it as a guide and he looks around. Is it really so? Is it really gratitude the most important result of creation? Uh, again, he, he writes a whole treatise, whole section about it. Like how, how uh, he uh, pro um, proceeds uh, step by step. And uh, here I would like to also quote him. Just as the wise Quran shows gratitude to be the purpose of creation, similarly, this macro Quran of the universe, Quran al-Kainat al-Kabir, demonstrates that gratitude is the most important result of creation. Yeah, he looks at how everything needs a uh, risk, uh, uh, how everything needs to be sustained and how every living being is happy uh, to be sustained. Uh, and uh, step by step, he sees that, yes, really what is, uh, what is produced uh, in creation is gratitude. Uh, so uh, it, it does, yeah. Again, he doesn't look any of these verses as a, a declaration. It is a guide uh, in my uh, in my search for the truth, the real, uh, and uh, how I should live my life, and how I can I how can I join the truth uh, kind of idea. Okay, and uh, next example. Uh, behold then, O oh man, these signs of God's grace, how he gives life to the earth after it has been lifeless. Verily, this self-same God is indeed the one that can bring the dead back to life, for he has the power to will anything. Okay, again, here he reads this verse, he gives life to the earth after it has been lifeless. 
uh, and he takes this suggestion uh, seriously and he goes to extended retreats by himself and he meditates on nature even uh, he has a house on a tree uh, like uh, they i think they still keep it uh, so he, and house. Uh, a tree house a small space uh -huh. Yeah, not a bit. <laughs> yeah, and um, at last uh, he writes a like kind of a, a hundred page treatise on resurrection. But he, uh, the foundation, the foundation is this verse: how he gives life to the earth after it had been lifeless. Yeah, he takes this seriously and he ponders upon it. Maybe. Uh, for months, for years. Okay, let's look another example. And this is the verse uh, about uh, shirk. Uh, maybe there are similar ones, I am not sure. Uh, such a false ascribing of divinity is indeed an awesome wrong, zulum. Uh, shirk is the, <coughs> shirk is a big, uh, Zulum, probably you have heard about it. Uh, again, he reads this verse, he listens to it, but how so? Uh, he <clears throat> he looks around himself and tries to understand how uh, ascribing divinity to, to things uh, can be an awesome injustice. Uh, isn't it too much? Uh, even he uh, asks it in his works. And does this reflect a cosmic reality? What happens? What do I experience if I disconnect the universe from the eternal one? And several times he imagines himself in such a situation as if he, uh, as if he is in shirk, as if he is uh, uh, disconnected from the creator and he imagines such a situation and tries to understand whether it is a hellish uh, kind of state or uh, not. He tries to confirm it whether uh, shirk is uh, an awesome wrong or not. <clears throat> okay. And uh, I also put uh, two examples from the prophetic stories. Uh, his, here, his approach is again the same. Uh, <clears throat> he reads these prophetic stories as communicating universal principles. He's not like, okay, uh, let me read the translations first. And he taught Adam all the names. And lo, Moses said unto his people, behold, God bids you to sacrifice a cow. Uh, he reads these verses and as if he asks, how can I witness and confirm this? Because uh, remember, he thinks that this is a universal address. It speaks to me and its purpose is to solve my human problems, to guide me. So what is the relationship? He asks as if. Uh, uh, he told Adam all the names. So what? I mean, how is this related to me? How can I relate to this? He asks this question so seriously. And uh, thanks to this, um, uh, to his dua, uh, I think uh, his prayer is accepted and he receives uh, the answers. Uh, for example, of course, I won't uh, go into the detail, but he understands that uh, the fact that Adam taught all the names is pointing to the fact that uh, all of us, each human being, has the potential uh, to know God and to be acquainted with God. And uh, he goes into detail. Or uh, in the case of Moses, and his people, uh, God is cautioning us uh, to make a blessing into an idol. 
So it is about me. Uh, it is, these are just uh, tips of an iceberg of meaning, uh, kind of. So uh, under each of these interpretations, we see the same mindset, same kind of uh, thinking. Uh, okay, I put also a practice for all of us to do here, but I'm not sure whether we have time, enough time. Um, I uh, also, uh, Isra, I came up with that infographic poster. Would you like me to share it or uh, I leave it to you maybe later or? Yeah, sure. Maybe we can do that at the end. Um, I'm excited about the practice. Uh, do you think it's going to take us long? Uh, let's take a few minutes. No, do it. no maybe um, five minutes. Yeah, I, I just, I myself also haven't think about the verse. Uh, I just wanted us to read this verse and ask the same questions uh, as uh, Imam Nursi, like, uh, is this a cosmic reality? How can I relate to it? Uh, how can I witness to it? How can I confirm it? Uh, or maybe we can, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. You can uh, relate the questions or the answers, doesn't matter. <laughs> Which questions would you ask to this verse? for example. Can you maybe share the info, infographic first and then we come back to the verse? So those are the tips of how to fish, I mean, okay. how to watch the Quran that you summarized. Yeah, so I think in the meantime, um, this is a helpful recap of uh, some of the fishing techniques, or if you will, um, maybe that's not the most uh, uh, best way to refer to, but how to approach the Quran and to read it for here and now. Um, yeah, please go ahead and share this thing. Uh, someone would like to read it? Yeah, but it looks small. Can you make it full screen? Okay. Uh -huh. Is it better? Uh, oh. and just... Yeah, if you click those bars on the on the very left top, yeah, how to depend? Yeah, if you click that, maybe it will be bigger. Hmm. We can also inshallah share this um with the WhatsApp group. How to read the Quran is a treasure map. Listen actively and be patient. Really try to listen and understand what the Quran is saying. Leave aside your cultural baggage and preconceived notions as much as possible. Remember the speaker and the addressee who is speaking. Read it as a universal address from the creator of the heavens and the earth to you here and now. Remember the purpose. Whatever the Quran mentions, the aim is to make the transcendent reality being known, known and to guide us in answering our core questions. Do not let its initial historical context overshadow its cosmic context. Bring your questions about the meaning of things and of your life. Ask, is it really so? How can I perceive and verify what I have listened to? Is it a cosmic reality? Is it relevant to me? How does this satisfy my heart and enlighten my life? And remember the Quran is a revelation. Ask, is this a meaning that I could not get? Read, get from existing beings and people? Am I afraid a transformation? 
if not come back to the verse later again and again. So with that, we can, um, this, this recap, we can come back to the verse uh, you wanted to us to mm -hmm. apply to, and then we'll, we'll go into um, discussion. And if Dr. Yabina has any, any insights to share, or if there are any questions, comments. Anyone who would like to um, give it a try? How would we read this verse in a way that we can see this part of cosmic reality? Ziba, I see you unmuted. Do you want to go ahead? Yeah, actually, if I see around myself and reflect on things and happening, may it be from plant to my own body, uh, how much am I uh, watching over things or I'm in control, you know? So if I start reflecting and seeing things around me and they are speaking out loud, you know, we, they are, it's happening and we are, they are not in control. I am sitting here and I don't know what all is going in my body. So there is someone who is uh, right now, right here, taking care of each and everything uh, in spite of me um, maybe claiming that, oh, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And so just um, being aware of your surroundings right here and now, we can pose that question and see like who is, who is doing and how is it happening? I think that's the first thing that came to my mind. I have a, a, a <laughs> I have a response from Yamina that she shared with me that follows Ziba's comment, which is the blossoming of the the blossoming of the flowers on the trees this season. Yamina says that she uh, I'm quoting you, Yamina, that you take your time looking at the blossoms and contemplating and reflecting on what do they mean? Could they, how do they come? And is this a confirmation of resurrection by the creator to confirm to us resurrection? So like to look and, and ask a question and confirm. Um, that is exactly what Yamina was telling me, Masha. I'll just jump in. Um, what this verse um, made me think about was, you know, within all of my experiences, is there ever anything that I can truly say that it happened haphazardly? That, you know, whether it be as, you know, like, for example, just because it was brought up the blossoming of the flower buds, that we see right now it's also raining right now um uh any like or even a particular experience i've had with a family member today um all of these kind of coming from a um a conscious source uh nothing um there's nothing that i can actually claim that exists by itself or um comes into being by itself um by its own in it, using its own will um and therefore anything that i experience must come from a conscious will and therefore anything that i experience also necessitates that um i am being watched over that I am never alone, that every single thing that is happening to me um, is very consciously, specifically, 
uh, particularly designed for me. So um, even if I may experience something that I'm not particularly fond of, that I might have a preference to dislike, um, it is uh, part of my personal syllabus of life, if you will. Thank you. Thank you uh, for sharing. But Mona, did you want to uh, suggest something as well about this verse? No, thank you. I was thinking same things and the same lines with Hatice Beza, I guess. Yeah, I mean, this notion of putting it in its cosmic context is, a, is an important ad, um, tip in reading the Quran, definitely. And something that was, you know, has been also very much emphasized in the Muslim Nur um, classes, um, by Dr. Yamira. Um, and uh, it, re it really can change our engagement with the Quran to, to hear it as helping us make sense of this reality that we're in. Um, I I wanted to I wanted to share something, the a verse that this reminded me of your um setting words, uh, but I, I'm going to hold back uh, to see if there are any other comments and, and questions um, or any comments from Dr. Yamina about um, in your presentation. Floor is open. Uh, salam alaikum. Hello. Alaikum salam. Uh, um, uh, I would like to thank uh, Fatmanur for this um, very how can I say, great presentation. And, you know, it makes me think a lot, uh, you know, throughout um, her speech. And, you know, actually one of her questions um, that really, how can I say, got into me, it's like how um, about uh, uh, Said Nursi, you know, he was very brave asking uh, different uh, difficult questions. And uh, because, you know, um, myself, I'm not such a brave person. And actually, uh, growing as a child, you know, learning about Islam, and, you know, we were kind of uh, taught that, you know, it's not, um, do not question, kind of, just accept it, okay? Because I think uh, one of the uh, main reasons behind it, the people uh, who are teaching us, they don't know how to answer our questions. So they just want to avoid our questions in order to make it easier for them, not for us. So now I'm kind of a 43 years old woman and now I'm much more braver. So I can ask questions. And uh, because um, I think uh, Said Nursi, since, you know, he has studied a lot and, you know, in Quran, there are many stories about the prophets. And, you know, sometimes I'm kind of, wow, the prophets are so brave. And, you know, they can judge, uh, they can ask questions to Allah. You know, they can, um, for example, uh, Hazrat Ibrahim, Hazrat Musa, you know, Moses, uh, Ibrahim and Yunus alayhi salam, you know. And um, I think the prophets are very brave. Uh, and they kind of ask questions to Allah most of the time. And since Sayyid Nursi has studied their lives, and when you know that, I think when you know the content, when you know more, you became uh, braver when you are asking questions because you know that it's not, we can ask questions. Even the prophets, they ask questions to Allah. So this is just one of my uh, comments about uh, Fatma uh, question. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mina. Um, Lynn has a comment. If you're able, go ahead. You had an article um, with the ti this title, right? Even, do I remember wrong? Like even prophets ask questions or something like that, or how to maybe ask, I am how to ask questions. Maybe yeah. <laughs> there's also another oh. title. Even the angels, yeah, ask. Um, yeah. So Lynn, I see your message here. Are you able to speak it? Okay. 
Sure. Um, I, I guess when I was um, sitting here um, thinking about this verse and um, trying to apply this method um, and Jazakallah khair for enlightening all of us into this method, I, I do think it is, um, it takes courage, but it's so, um, it's so fulfilling. Um, but what I was sitting here thinking about was, um, you know, if, if God is ever watchful, over you, over me. So if I think about creation, where could I go where I somehow escape the watch of God or the care of God um, or somehow forego the, my need of God? Um, is it a place or is it a state of being where I could escape this? And then, of course, every time I try to think of something, it's no. You know, even in the belly of the whale, God is still near. Or even in a state of sleep, God is still near. So this is how I see this in the, in the speech of creation. Yes, and if uh, connecting with Ziba's comment, if God is not ever virtual, then I can't even be in the state of sleep because all the cells and everything has to be maintained and, and the oxygen needs to be sent and my, my lungs are to be made to work. So, you know, worlds and universes within each, 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 uh, within each other has to be maintained for me to be even try to <laughs> escape mm -hmm. Um, yeah, Lin's point uh, came to me the next step kind of first like um, um, like before I was put into the belly of the whale if I had that uh, I had this training exercise and of shahada, shahada like witnessing okay he yes he is watchful yes he is watchful here and here there everywhere and when I am suddenly in the belly of the whale, okay, no, this is not an exception. Uh, of course, like first few moments, I will still be so afraid and I will be in stress. But if I have the uh, enough training, uh, I would be able to respond like uh, Joseph, Joseph, no, Jonah, alayhi salam. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Um, I think all the, the the questions that come to us normally when we read, um, I'm assuming, when we read God is watchful over you, it is uh, it feels scary, and it feels almost like a breach of uh, privacy. And if he is watchful over me, where am I going to, where can I even run away? But all these questions are coming from a place of not knowing who God is and not being aware of my relationship with him and therefore not being aware of who I am as a created being. And that's why this approach is so important because the first thing uh, we learn from this approach uh, in the Risale Nur is when I read this, I don't go there, but I go first. The, the He's brave, we said, is in asking the question. I am told in the Quran, he is watchful over you. Look average uh, tafsir, he, they will tell you, God is watchful over you, so be careful, you know, you can't live as you like. And it's totally correct, but I am not convinced that he is watchful over me, and I don't know what it means. Even if I am convinced, I, I made my mind, I am not going to question the Quran, and I'm going to surrender. I don't know what it means. That's why when I ask, is he watchful over me? How is he watchful over me? Then what uh, Ziba uh, said comes. He is watchful. I start, he is watchful over you, all of us. Um, and I see that not a cell can exist without his control. So 
surely he is watchful over every single thing by default everything and the more i uh, reflect and contemplate because this this reality this truth is so comprehensive that it is beyond us understanding it intellectually it is even beyond our imagination but we can start feeling how encompassing it is, how uh, relevant it is, how indispensable it is, how uh, great a, um, a blessing it is by staying with it and just stay with it and be present with it and just taste it, experience it, stay. I mean, how... How does it feel to eat honey? Eat it and stay. You stay there and the more you stay with it, the more you will become aware of its states. How does it taste? Uh, uh, how does it feel to experience rain? Go out, it's raining right now. Go out, stay in the rain. And the more you uh, are present, you are not thinking about other things, you're not distracted, you're totally present with it and aware, the, the, then you start becoming one with it, you appreciate it more and more. Now, after this experience, now it doesn't feel the same way. God is watchful over me, doesn't feel like a separate being and watching me, it's like an... Uh, um, hidden camera in my house that's not what it means that's totally different it's everywhere and it's like it's taking care it's rububia it's uh, providing it's uh, so there is yes a sense of accountability at the end but it doesn't come out of uh, being scared and not knowing what it means it's like feeling very close and being taken care of and only in times of forgetfulness we will feel that like running away because that in in those times we're running away from ourselves we're running away from all reality in fact into an illusion but when we are present this that he is watchful over us is uh, good news it's rahma it's a blessing it's a uh, we start celebrating it. It tastes so good. It feels so good. And so the accountability that comes with it is like um, an, a, a reminder from a close friend, you know, reminding you, you know, you have to do this now. You said you wanted to do this now. So it's it gives us a little more, uh, I wouldn't say it motivation because motivation already um assumes that we are forcing ourselves but this is something coming from inside out it makes accountability in the sense of everything now has more meaning and uh, purpose therefore it's more um not tempting but like it's it's beautiful it's worth pursuing it's worth living uh in in surrender so it reminds us how how beautiful it is accountability in that uh, in that sense inshallah and for me this approach is extremely important because now the more i contemplate the more i have an inkling uh, uh, on what it means that he is watch watchful over all of us otherwise there is no way i can know that i would be just assuming uh god is watchful but watchful in my mind means like maybe a boss over an employee or a mom over the baby or it's has no it's not the real god is watchful over you it's the same with the first uh, the first area uh, yeah, that uh, Fatma Noor shared uh, with us, yeah, Ayyuhal Nasu. No, what was it? Inna Allah um, So that in that 
uh, aya, uh, lots of um, tafsirs will give kind of uh, Allah has, uh, I'm reading, I'm, I'm trying to find uh, this. This is uh, Ibn Kathir, that's well known. He's saying, so I'm not reading the Arabic, but the English is Allah states that he has compensated the believers for their lives and wealth if they give them up in his cause with paradise Allah you give up your life and your wealth Allah compensates you with paradise and then he says this demonstrates Allah's favor and generosity and bounty because he has he has accepted the good that he had already he already owns and he has bestowed uh, on you, like in the first place. That's it. Finished. Afterwards, it's uh, it carries on on something else. Now, what he's saying is correct, but the most important thing is if they give them in his cause. Actually. The Quran doesn't even say in his cause, it says they give them back. Ah, okay. Okay. So that's the, the the key point. I want to give, I want to give uh in in God's path, in God's cause. How do I give in God's cause? No one tells me how. And so you go and find there are many uh, hadith, hadiths, and some are uh, Qudsi hadith, God speaking in. And you find there that um, on the Day of Judgment, uh, in one of them at least, it says uh, on the Day of Judgment, the first people to be judged will be someone who was a mart martyred. It means this person was shaheed, died, gave his life in the cause of God. The person believes so. So he will be brought and Allah will ask, God will ask uh, him, like, I gave you lots of uh, blessings. What did you do with them? And the man said, I fought in your cause. And it's it's not even I fought in in Arabic. I think it was yes. It is qatil qatil tu fika hatta stushhita stushhitu. I fought in in your cause until I was martyred. I died as a martyr. And he will be said. Allah will say you have lied. This is not a Qudsi hadith, but in the Qudsi hadith. You all know, you know, the person who uh, Allah says, uh, what have you done? He says, I um, I fed, I gave this, I did this. I learned the Quran. I was an expert in the Quran. But each time it will be you did it for other reasons, for yourself, for people, for. So here also he says, um, uh, you have lied. Directly, you have lied. Like we are told in the Quran, they say we worshipped God. You say, no, you lied. You were mushriks. You believed in other things. You gave importance to other things. You have lied for you fought only that it would be say, said that you were brave. You wanted people to say, oh, he is a brave man. And it was said. People said you were brave. Finished. You got what you wanted. Like, why are you expecting something in the hereafter? You got, you wanted people to say that? So this means, why are these hadith here? It's attracting our attention. You know, when you are saying, I gave, I done something in God's cause, are you sure it is so? Do you know what it means that it is in God's cause? And in, in the tafsir of that ayah, Imam Nursi, rahimahullah, he particularly 
the emphasis is on how to use everything and everything here doesn't mean only uh, you, my life doesn't mean only there is a war and I am going to uh, die. No, I am dying every time. How am I using my tongue, my eyes, my faculties, my intellect, my body? How am I using my time in his name or in my name? That's the difference. Yeah, and if I can just jump in here, uh, there is a similar verse that um, I heard recited and I couldn't believe the verse, even though I read Surah Baqarah before uh, a number of times. I don't know. Um, so, it, and the, the the one that Fatma recited, it is in the context of um, fighting. In the, there are other verses uh, around by Paul say about fighting. So you can say, well, maybe, uh, you know, it's fair to focus on fighting because it's, it has in some uh, references to it, but he, this comes up. Uh, there is no reference to uh, fighting in, in the preceding verses, um, and it talks about the person who is doing wrong. Uh, and whenever he's told, be conscious of God, he goes, uh, becomes arrogant and goes into sin and so on. And then it says, "Starry bilah wa min nas man yishri nafsahu ittaqa amardat Allahi wa Allahu raufun bil ibad." So there is a person, so in contrast, is, uh, there, is, there are uh, people. Are people. Who, yeah. Man yeshri. I'm like, yeshri? Like in my Arabic, is not pronounced like yeshri. Sells. Literally, someone who sells nafsahu for uh, looking for uh, mardatila, pleasure of God. And um, the, the translations are kind of struggling with it. What does, what does that mean? Like, is there a business transaction here? What's happening? So there is a kind of man who would willingly sell. So a sad translation says, who would willingly sell his own life. Who would? Yeah, he's so willing. He's so de dedicated that he would be happy to sell. And what does that exactly mean? Um, it's a literally sell. And then Abdul Halim translation says, a kind of man who gives his life away. To please God, but it literally says sells. And what do we make with that selling? And then the um, the next verse is talking about full surrender. Um, so um, I think one of the things to keep in mind is, as you said, uh, to come back to how we can apply it to us here and now. And it isn't pushing the boundaries of the Quran. It is actually. Um, a faithful reading of the Quran. Why in the middle of no way it's a cell, you know, what does that mean? And I think a part of the challenge is we keep reading and moving on quickly, quickly. And there's there seems to be a lot of repetition. So, you know, you just keep going and going. But when you slow down and keep that, wait a second, who's speaking to me? And there is the creation as speech and the Quran is, uh, unpacking that speech and coinciding with that speech, and it, it is not just declaring but giving us um, treasure keys to treasures uh, on earth that uh, can, inshallah, transform how we approach the Quran. Um, yeah, I just wanted to put this in here, and I wanted to also note that all of the things that Fatma mentioned as um, important in Mursi's approach, which is. Uh, the case, um, it doesn't mean it's unprecedented in Islamic history. There, there has been different interpreters who um, uh, who have highlighted these things. It's just that it's very accessible and consistent in the way Lucy is doing. Even that verse, um, uh, selling yourself to God, you know, a lot of them, um, a lot of them, uh, would just give one example, but there are even uh, earlier and before your there are even less, more rare, but uh, there are interpreters who said that this is not surrendering yourself to God, not simply um, becoming a martyr in an actual uh, just war. Um, okay, um, but um, is our time is um, drawing to a close. Uh, are there any other final comments? Questions. There are some comments written, Israel, maybe in the chat. 
in the chat. Okay, I'm ready to read. Um, Noha comments on being watchful about what we care about uh, regarding your sample question. Uh, uh, what came to me how, was how we are watchful over what we care about, such as our valuables and children, or children uh, like Shepherd or Rashid. Uh, and in response to that, Muhammad Said said, it's another sign that somebody's watching over my variables or children, therefore I experience this fear. Or I care about my well-being more than anything else. Can you all say that this is also the care of my maker? Um, um, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure if I understand uh, Muhammad Said. Question Are you able to speak, yeah, brother? Yes, salam alaikum. I think it's, uh, I don't know if if there's, uh, would you like to say what is it that is hard to understand in this question? I wanted to basically add to Noha's comment as a, like using her comment or his comment as a starting point for kind of to add what I was thinking. Um, do, would you like to say your question? Um, Commenting? What is the sign? Mm. Oh, yeah, the sign is that me being watchful over my valuables is the sign that uh, since this, uh, this, um, this quality of being watchful over things, caring about things is not from me. It means whoever the source of me uh, must be the source of this quality in me. So I, I can um, relate to my maker when I, whenever I experience uh, the care over some, some, something else or somebody else. And so... Uh, the sign is basically the sense of care. Is the mm -hmm. sign that my my uh, my maker is the caring one. Like I can see, so I understand he must be the seer. It's one of the um, in San Pangeresi in the windows, the window of human being. How we get to know about the beautiful names of God. One of them is this. I have seen, so the creator must be seeing. Of course, he's seeing and mine are totally different, but mine is like a unit of measurement. And we have the sense of muraqaba and to watch over our well-being, our things around us. Yes. Makes sense. Alhamdulillah. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. Since I... Uh... I have um, these, all these uh, thinking, reflecting people. And I also want to confirm if my understanding, um, although I get a little bit confirmation already, but like I find myself kind of worried and with uh, caring about my well being always. So if I relate this care for myself, to, to or, or if I take this care as the verse um, Fatma Nur um, offered us to reflect over was telling us that uh, God is always ever watchful. Uh, so if I take my sense, uh, my my um, care for myself as my Creator is caring for me, I I felt that this connection is very short. And um, uh, it's always available for me because I always care about myself. What do you think about this understanding? Thank you. Yeah, one thing that comes to my mind is that um, 
like I don't always watch myself meaning I'm not even self-aware many times like it's a slow but but I in, in terms of um trying to watch out for myself you, uh, yes I think we can use that experience how am I able to um care care and be worried uh, about myself and that is a sign that I made to um to be able to be watchful always myself and it's and, and partly it's not even conscious maybe that's okay too you know like if you wanted to stop breathing your body doesn't allow you to keep yourself from breathing and finally you, you can't hold yourself and you will have to and that's even part of being watchful that you be uh your body's being made to watch you but um yeah i think that that could also be a time Any other comments, questions? If not, then we can pause here. And next next week, um, Sister Shema and Sister Hatija will be presenting on uh, responding to dualism and the face of calamities, dualism between this world and next world. How do we um, get out of that in the face of calamities? Um, well, I mean, it's much more um, interesting and exciting that I can than I can explain here. But so, inshallah, I will look forward to that. Um, Doctor Yamina, would you like to say any closing words or any closing prayer? <clears throat> Go ahead, inshallah. You 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 make the prayer. Um, Please go ahead. <laughs> okay, I guess um inshallah I pray for myself and for the whole this you know family and every every everyone um to be more uh, open to receiving guidance from the Quran and to really um be among those who um are guided and healed through the Quran, as the Prophet ﷺ said, may it be a healing to our hearts and uh, a light to our, our eyes and our um, body. Inshallah, may Ramadan be a good opportunity for us to tune in. Uh, inshallah. Bismillah, uh, my Rahim, Subhanaka la ilma ila ila ma'alam tana ila ki anta la ilma hakeem wa akhir da'wahum ila alhamdulillah rabbil alam. Assalamu uh, alaikum everyone and inshallah let's keep each other in dua and thank you again to Fatima Nur and Dr. Yamina and everyone who has presented. Jazakallah khair Fatima Nur for bringing this verse. It's uh, opening up to us mashallah and a verse worth reflecting inshallah. May Allah make this reflection in the mizan of your hasanat and that of Yamina and Isra and everyone receiving your jazakallah kulla khair. Thank you. Thank you, Fi Amanila.